Hi, everybody. It's Stacey Silva with Salonology, our new podcast with Salon Today. And today I'm with Katie Trent. Um, she's the President and Chief Operating Officer with Jean Juarez. And how many locations do you have now in Seattle? As of last week, we have 10. Yeah, you just opened an, a new one, right? Yeah, yeah. Super exciting. Great. Well, along with that new one, you've made some changes to your policies that are improving the experience for both your team and your clients. So we wanted to talk through those because a lot of them are kind of modern age thinking, I think. That's so, a good idea, for sure. And, and might be things other salons might want to consider. Um, but first off, you guys have for many, many years have specialized. So when, when stylists sign on, they choose a track, they're either a cutter or a colorist, but you're changing that now. Why the change now? And how are you going to get people who have already on board to be doing both? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so not without a lot of thought, and I will just preface this whole topic by saying we're celebrating our 50th year this year, which is Oh, that's, that's, that's a huge. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. and especially I would say the last year and a half or so, um, like so many in our industry have been maybe the most unique and challenging. Um, and it's really given us the opportunity and in some cases forced the conversation to really examine, you know, are we doing things because that's the way they've always been done? Or are we doing things because that's the way that they should be done? And so that sort of colors a lot of what I think we'll probably talk about today. Um, but when I first started here, which was in May of 2020, while we were shut down, um, just trying to really learn and absorb a lot about what what Jean Juarez is and why it is that way. Um, and specialization is something that's really important and foundational to so many in our company, but really also our industry. And it's right. what Jean, the man, built our company on. So at first it felt like that's something we shouldn't touch, but you know, the more that we thought about it, a lot in our industry has changed and the economy has also so changed. So people don't necessarily go and look for a career company anymore. They go and they look for a place where they can have a great experience and, you know, maybe for a season or maybe for a lifetime. And so what we found was when we were talking to artists who were really talented, whether they're seasoned or if they were new and wanted to come apprentice for us, the specialization was really holding them back from wanting to commit to Jean Juarez. And so it it harder to recruit. Did that make it harder to recruit? Big time. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times people would say, you know, I'd love to come work for you. You've got this great reputation. I know I'll be busy, but I just can't, I just can't make that choice for myself. So we did a lot of talking with the team to just really closely understand what about specialization was so critical and ultimately came together to find a path forward where we can still honor and support people who choose to specialize, but also allow people who want to put the time in to get excellent at both, to have that opportunity with us. Okay, so it'll be optional for people who are already on board. And Correct. if they want to stay that way, they can. Because I mean, there are benefits to it. Obviously, if you specialize, you you have a chance to hone those skills even more sharply and and be, be among the best at, at that specialization. But at the same time, I've gone to a song like that as a client. It's a little challenging sometimes when you're, either trying to book and you're with this person for that and that person for that and you're trying yeah. to, or you're feeling handed off or yeah um, a lot of people work together me. too and so yeah. they're like oh we have to take our vacations together or you know, right. just, it does create some challenges that in the right circumstances are worth it but a lot of people just don't want to make that commitment so now for those um team members existing team members who do, do decide that they want to be able to do both but they've been specializing for the last couple of years are you doing more in-house education to get their mm -hmm. skills on the other side of the fence up to date absolutely so what we found in our discussions was the most critical thing that everybody was concerned about is that we would in some way be lowering our standards and so what we decided to do is first open up to our own existing team and say you know if you want this opportunity to cross train we're going to have you go through the same classes that you would if you were new to our company and specializing in one path and we were really surprised that the message went over extremely well and we filled up our classes for cross training. So people are really excited. Not everybody's adding the service to their books. Some people are just kind of going through the classes to have a better understanding, but um, 
but it's been by and large a success in rollout. And um, I was just looking, we have quite a few people who are opening the new salon who have even bookings of cut and color on their books and they're new, they're new at the other craft. And that's, that's exciting for me. Well, that is exciting. Yeah. Um, you're also changing, updating your commission structure. You say to be more fair and balanced to everybody. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Um, so this again goes back to being a 50 year old company. Um, we're blessed with a lot of really long tenured artists. So people who've been here 20, 30 plus years um, have amazing clientele are so critical to the core of our business. Um, but what I found coming in was our company had kind of gotten into a place of really rewarding tenure to the point where newer artists were struggling to find their place and really kind of their share of the pie. So um, it really started with our commission structure. We started lower than market and capped out lower than market. And our metrics also made it really difficult for people to move up through commission levels. Um, and when we really looked at our team, our artists are getting really high feedback ratings from their guests. They're booked up. They're, you know, by all accounts, really excellent hairstylists who, who weren't sharing in the success of the company. So we raised our commission floor and our commission ceiling. We also added a tier for the very top performers in the company so that there's kind of that elite level that they can get to that we found smaller salons were able to provide. And for whatever reason, we just weren't, we weren't playing in that area. So yeah, so we introduced that. Um, we also gave across the board raises in March and then again in July, just to get people kind of caught up from maybe where they hadn't had raises for for some time or not as many as they might have at our competitors. And also just to thank them for getting us through this crazy challenging period of COVID. Um, one other change that we've made is historically, if somebody had a redo, they wouldn't get paid for the redo. And I feel like it's our choice as a company to guarantee our services. And so we don't wanna penalize our team or have them kind of resenting or rushing a guest service who comes back for a redo. And so we now pay for those as well. Great. Um, you're also relaxing your dress code and you're emphasizing this will help non-binary team members have no undue restrictions. Mm -hmm. So how are you changing the dress code and what does that, give us an example of how that will change for non-binary team members. Sure. At, frankly, our dress code was just kind of out of date and it really focused on a lot of don'ts, but it also said things like women must wear makeup or, you know, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, things like that. So at this point, there's no mention of gender period. We kind of focus more on what the do's are. So do wear these colors, <laughs> do look yeah. polished. Um, but there's no mention of makeup. There's no mention of gender in the, in the dress code whatsoever. Um, and we also specifically call out, which wasn't previously part of our dress code, that head scarves, head wraps, and other elements of professional dress that are just more common in non-white cultures are also okay, great, welcome, that sort of thing. Okay, great. Um, and then you're implementing mandatory cultural sensitivity training. I know we have this as a, co a corporation, but for salons that don't, what does that mean? And what will, what will employees learn by going through it? Sure. Um, so I think a, a lot of us in the industry remember um, after the death of George Floyd and a lot of the um, the impact that that had on our society and our nation, a lot of stories started coming out. Like I remember Vogue Beauty had a story about how there's really no training on textured hair in beauty school that's that's required. Um, and that was definitely true of our own beauty schools. We have since remedied that. Um, but in our salons, we have introduced mandatory training that just talks about systemic racism and its impact on the beauty industry. And that being one of the things that, you know, people aren't even trained on um, different hair textures in beauty school. Um, so it was important to us to kind of introduce those concepts for anybody that hasn't personally sought out the education on their own. Um, and it was also an important foundation to sort of tee up other changes that we've introduced to enhance our guest experience for people who have textured hair. Um, we also have changed our terminology to stop centering white hair. So we just talk about hair on the spectrum now that's really common in our industry of type 1A. So my hair would be type 1A to type 4C for really tight coily curled hair. And so rather than, than say, you know, 
all hair is considered one way, except for this one hair that we have a term for. We just talk about hair on the spectrum. Uh, as a texture instead of a skin color, really. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I had something else I was going to Now, you guys did bring in, I know I did a story about four or five years ago where you brought in either We Dad or Diva Curl, one of the lines that specializes oh, sure. in, in high, highly textured hair. So, and that was part of an effort to expand your client base. Um, mm -hmm. So that this kind of goes hand in hand with that. A little bit, yeah. Um, we do have We Dad and at the time when it came in, we certified curl experts. And so those are the people that, um, if you have curly hair, you would specifically seek seek a curl expert out. You can still do that. And we definitely have people who are more passionate about curly hair and just absolutely love working with curly hair. Um, so that remains, but we also are ensuring that all of our artists are comfortable and, you know, very skilled at, at any hair any type hair that's in their hair. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, and you're also creating a new inclusive booking experience that that lets clients book on hair type. How does that work? And how yeah, is it well, different than what they see today? Yeah, it's sort of, it's the natural extension of the training that we've been doing. Um, and it's always been part of our operations that if you have a particular hair type that's going to take more time, you know, you could call and say, oh, I need two service times because my hair just takes longer. Right. But it's sort of, it's like the secret menu at Starbucks that, you know, everybody kind of knows about, but nobody really knows about. And we wanted to make sure that somebody just coming to Gene Morris for the first time wouldn't think, you know, oh, this probably isn't the place for me. It is. We want you to come see us. But what we've done is introduce four haircut variants. So just based on the description of your hair, you would choose which service best applies. Okay. Um, the artists are able to, to gear it to their own timings. So we have a haircut that's as long as 90 minutes, but somebody might say, you know, I can knock those out in an hour and they adjust their own timing. But that way, somebody who comes in doesn't have an awkward experience that they booked a service and there's not enough time to get it done. Right. And sometimes they don't know how to book that, you know, they'll call and they just book a haircut, but they don't know how to say, or they don't even know you know, mine takes longer than the average haircut. Yes, so. and they shouldn't have to, you know, right. that they shouldn't have to, so. Now, what, you, what kind of software do you guys use and is it flexible enough to allow you to do that? Because the other factor of time is how fast somebody works, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, we use Zenodi, which is um, a local point of sale software company that also happens to be growing and um, used worldwide but they do allow a ton of customization where, you know, we can create these haircut variants, but then people can also gear it to their own timings and there's lots of add-ons and, and all sorts of options that make it really customizable without a ton of heavy lifting. Now, do you all have online booking? We do, yeah, we have online yeah. booking and we also have a mobile app. Okay, so, uh, cause there are a lot of salons that are still hesitant to do that. They're hesitant about turning the control over to the client to book yeah. that appointment. Mm -hmm. But what, what would you say to, to salons that are still not there yet? I think you got to do it. It's 2021. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you clients know, want like, it. I mean, clients want to be able to book when it's convenient for them. For sure. It you also frees up your operations. Yeah. Yeah. It frees up your operations too, to not spend five minutes booking every single client. We're at about 45% of our clients now book themselves online or through that. Oh, that's great. Okay. So. And how many pre-book would you say? Well, we have really high demand right now. So <laughs> you, you're looking at about three week lead time to get an appointment generally. So almost everyone, um, we are working with our artists to try to get them to book their clients while they're still in the chair, especially coming into holiday, just to say, you know, if you want to get in before Thanksgiving or Christmas, you better have yeah, those now. Clients. Yeah, I've, I've even done, I go to a little salon here in Florida, but, um, you know, just the demands change since the pandemic. So I'm, I, I always book three appointments ahead just because I just yeah. want to know that they're there. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, and then you guys are also part of Green Circle Salons mm -hmm. and you're working towards um, being beauty service carbon neutral. What does that mean for you? And how does it make a marketing point of difference for your, for your salon? Sure. Um, so we've partnered with Green Circle since about 2015. And part of their 
mission and goal and ours as well is that, you know, you start your partnership, but you're always looking to expand on it. And so what we did very recently is work with them to say, okay, you know, we're collecting all of our beauty service waste, but then it's sitting on a truck and going somewhere. And so that's kind of, that's kind of diminishing the sustainability. Right. And so we're now offsetting that with carbon, carbon offset coupons or whatever that's called um, to the extent that we can now say our beauty services are carbon neutral. Um, we did talk to them about, you know, they said, you can say you're carbon neutral. And we're like, that's not, that's not technically true. And we don't want to be greenwashing or saying something that's not completely transparent. So we still have retail products coming in on trucks and people driving themselves to work. And, you know, if you took a really fine tooth comb at what, what goes into any business and certainly ours, um, we're not completely carbon neutral, but that's something we'll keep chipping away at and, and driving toward. Well, I think it's really important to be um, both authentic with your, your clients and because a lot of people bring in a green line and then they say that they're a green salon, but they're, if they're not looking at their operations and looking at that side, um, they're not truly being a good environmental steward. And right. today's clients are very sophisticated. So they start questioning things like that. They want to know how things are run. And it means, it means something to them then when they really believe that you're really doing it. Absolutely. Um, I know just from shopping, you'll see tons of, I'm so sorry, there's a, there's can't a do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of companies right now who will. It's not. All right. It's going right by my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of fashion companies that will claim that they're sustainable. And when you take a look at it, it's like, oh, you know, we use organic cotton, but it's being created in Malaysia and it's coming across on a cargo ship and there's nothing really that sustainable about it. And so I just want to not put ourselves in a position of basically greenwashing or whatever the term would be for our industry and, and being really authentic and transparent. Now, I know a lot of the Green Circle salons also charge clients an environmental fee. Do you do that as well? We do, yes. And how does it show up on their receipt or are they, are they clear that that's what that is? Yep, it shows on every receipt as the environmental service fee. We also have a footnote on our website explaining very clearly what that is. Um, so we're we're as upfront about it as I think we can be that that's part of every service. That's great. I think that really makes a difference. Well, Katie, it's been great to talk to you. Tell us a little bit about the new salon before we oh, go. Sure. Yeah. So historically, Jean Juarez has been built on massive salon and spa. Mega, and mega salon. Mega, yeah. Generally located at a mall. And again, our evolution as a brand, we're looking more toward being where people live and work versus being a destination. And so we opened in kind of a bustling neighborhood uh, that borders in Seattle, neighborhoods called Belltown and South Lake Union, where a lot of people who work for Amazon, Google, Microsoft kind of live and work. And so we opened a little 2,500 square foot salon right there. Um, it's got two skincare rooms and seven salon chairs and it's just cute as a button and we're really excited about it. That's great. So you think that the future for GNRs will be building more of those? I think so. Yeah, we'll always have our, our flagships that you know are popular and in, and in traffic centers where people are, are still really wanting to be, but in terms of being a destination that you drive to the mall to, you know, I think, I think we'll scale down and go for this more boutique concept. Love it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for being with us and love that you're doing all these innovative, creative things in yeah, HR and, for the opportunity. and uh, client experience. So take care. Likewise. Thanks, Stacey.